need faith to give, eh? Some of you had to have faith this morning to wake up, to come to church. No, I just want to testify that um, in September, um, Kubis lost his job at the school where he was teaching. But the Lord has been so good to us, and he's been so busy that he hasn't been to church for a while, um, because <laughs> he's teaching so many extra um, lessons and so on that the Lord has really shown me how we can bless you, even in a time that you thought was going to be a time of tribulation and of distressing about money or whatever. And the Lord just came and He blessed us so much. Yeah, that's good fruit on giving. A last person. Who's going to be the last one to come? Yeah, come running there from the back. Good. So I just want to testify what happened at the business. So... A couple of, there were a couple of months it was really, really going not as it should go. And then last month, our first three vehicles, we gave away at cost. And then after that, we just started selling and selling and selling, and we almost had our best month. Yeah, that's a good testimony, eh? All right, do you believe that giving is biblical? Do you, do you have an ear to hear what the Lord or the Spirit of God is saying? All right, Tony has got an ear to hear. So let's hear what God says and then easy, just do it. So when God gives you instruction today to give whatever it is, whether it's an offering, a tithe, whether it's something towards the building project, towards the Giving Hearts project, I don't know. But for a moment, close your eyes and just say, there, Father, show me how to give and what to give today. Will you do that? Every eye closed with me. Thank you, Lord, that we can bless the offering today, that we all can just be obedient to the voice of God, that we know, Father, that you've got our best uh, in your heart, in your mind for us. And when we give today, we give from that place of complete contentment and rest in the finished work of Christ for each one of us. So, Lord, uh, receive these offerings, these tithes, as unto you, not unto man, uh, from a heart of great thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Now you can give. Give as the Holy Spirit shows you to give. You can come here to the front. You can go there to the back. And um, yeah, let's see what the Lord does in us in this season. Amen. I've got some notes here again. If you want some notes, this first session or set of notes is on what we did in the Bible school on Monday and spoke about joy and the power of happiness and joyfulness, playfulness. Anybody want something like that? You're more than welcome to come and get. Awesome. Yeah, and then I think I've got some notes here on last Sunday. Anybody want some notes on last Sunday? Can you let it some of fat? Awesome. Good. Yeah. We've been busy uh, speaking on uh, the war in Israel and how that influences each and every one of us. Hello, hello. And uh, today we're going to finish or continue with that. I'll finish next week. It's just something that I just want to say this morning that really uh, I felt during the worship as well. You know, um, we live in a, in a time, in a, not only us, you know, it's as long as one can remember in history, uh, life uh, where there's humans, uh, in, we want to be validated. Eh? In life, we want to feel important. We want to feel that, um, you know what, our wife, she loves us. Our husband, they love us. We want to feel validated. We want to feel that our children, they appreciate us. We want people to say things, you know. Um, in religion, all other religions also work like that, you know. It is that you have to do this, and then you have to do this, and then God will validate you, or you will be approved, or you will be okay with God. But, you know, Christianity is the only religion throughout time where that is not the case. That our validation our worth is not in what people say to us, even though we've got that need. Eh? Come on, be honest with me. How many of you want to know 
that you're a good mom. You want to know that, that you are value, valued at work. Eh? You want to know that they like you. You want to know that you are doing a good job. And how many of you, f- you know that in today's world, you don't get that often that, eh? And if we seek it from, from somebody, we tend to put burdens on people instead of recognizing that the only one that, that needs to validate me is God. And in the Christian faith, He does that by sending His Son to die for us so that, uh, and that is the, the wonderful, the Bible says, He made Him who knew no sin to become sin so that we can be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Him who knew no sin became sin. Isn't that incredible? So, Jesus took upon Him sin. He didn't become a sinner. He took sin upon Himself. And when God looked at Jesus, He saw all the sins of the world, past and present, and that He died for. So that now, when Jesus looks at us, He sees us as Jesus is without sin. Isn't that incredible? So we stand before a living God, not based upon whether I am good, He is not pleased with me, whether I pray five hours, ten hours, He is pleased with me, pint, point, no comma, come on. And He says to you today, you are awesome, you are a hard worker, I love your smile, come on. I love the way you dress this morning. He looks at you and he is our validator. Is that good if I put it like that? Jesus said a wonderful thing. He said to his father, when he prayed, he said, Father, help me to show them that you love them as you love me. As you love, uh, not uh, Father, help me to show them how that you would love them like, you know, maybe you, you, you do me. No, it is as. It is as. It is precis. The same way God loves His Son, He loves you. Isn't that just incredible? For some of you this morning, you've got to hear He loves you as He loves Jesus. You've got to hear this morning, you are worth something. You are of value. Uh, let your validation be in the mouth of your Creator. Come on, somebody say Amen. Huh? So don't feel that nobody loves you and you're not worth anything based upon what this one said, your child says, you. come on, this one did. Let your validation today lie in that wonderful, unfailing, consistent, come on, Love that Jesus has for us. Amen? Good. Good. So this morning, having said that, we're going to go into uh, what we are busy discussing about uh, Israel and the things that's happening there and a prophetic biblical perspective that we get from there. Please listen to the other sessions so that you can catch up if you've not listened to them. To give some perspectives next week, I'm going to speak to you specifically about Israel and the church. And that will be the last session and how Jesus changes the picture for us today. How many of you understand that whether we believe it or not, Jesus is coming? Yeah? Whether we believe it or not, there will be a rapture. Amen. Some of you are already I'm stepping on some toes. Uh, Whether you believe it or not, there'll be a judgment, and all of us will be judged, the Bible says. Whether you like it or not, there will be a war. And that's the thing that I'm going to speak to you about today. Uh, I don't watch that thing, that movie. Uh, I'm going to try to get it, but it had such awesome adverts at one stage about a year or so ago. Its advert was, Winter is Coming. What's the story versus the wings? What? Game of Thrones. I never watched it, but the, the, the advert sort of got me. The winter is coming. And if I, that's why I chose this theme. War is coming. Uh, 
not to frighten you, but that's what the Bible speaks about. At the end, there'll be a great war, and that'll be Armageddon, the war of, of wars that'll end all other wars. So if we speak about signs, we spoke about them a bit over this time. One of the, the signs, one of the greatest signs, will be a war coming that'll end all other wars. Now, if we understand it correctly, if we uh, believe in the rapture, we will only see the intro of this war and not walk through the entire war, which might be problematic if you are waiting to get yourself sorted out for a war because we will be raptured away before the full force of that war is unleashed upon this earth. So you might miss it because it might just be the interlude to a great war coming. And that is why there's so much being said about the war in Israel. Because as believers, we are looking for something with that geographical area in mind. Again, if we speak about the church in Israel now next week, there's a total shift and paradigm that we've got to find. And in knowing that we are God's children and we are the new Jewish nation, we are the new Israel in God as the believers of God. But yet still that geographical space has some prophetic intent. And we cannot deny it. Jesus will not come to uh, New York and put his foot there. He will put it on Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. And the war that we are speaking about will be somewhere in today's West Bank area. That's where Armageddon is between Judea and Samaria, Samaria. In that physical location. You can go there today to the valley of Armageddon. And interesting, all those areas has been built up so much, but nobody has tried to touch that valley as if to say, here gaat nog iets groots gebeur. Ons moet die spasie oophou vir die tanks. I don't know, you know? So uh, a major war, uh, the Bible speaks about the war that will end all wars, and we will speak a bit about this today. If, if we want to start off, how many of you know that Jesus is both a lamb but also a lion? Amen? And you know, some of us, we, we sort of miss it because we interpret the personality of Christ based on where we are at and where we think from and where our worldview has formed from. And many of us having a lion nature will interpret Jesus in a certain way. Having a lamb-like nature will interpret the whole of Scripture from that basis. And He is neither one nor the other. He is both. Come on, church. That apostolic principle I've trained you in for many years is to move away from an either-or mindset. That's dualism. And that is is either this or either that. And move into that space of understanding. It's probably both. And there's something better to explore and to understand yet. We don't have it all together yet. Come on. But we know Jesus is both the lion and the lamb. The lamb nature we know. And uh, the Bible speak about that uh, a lot. And also the lion. But uh, in Revelation 5 verse 5 to 6. We find them both in one Context. So I want to read that to you today. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5 to 6. And it says there, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep, see the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. I mean, if you understand that wherever we see uh, in the Word of God, we see the connection always back to the land, back to the lineage. So what have we learned thus far? This battle that we have, that we're seeing unfolding right now, is a battle over covenant. It is a battle over covenant. The covenant that came with Abraham. And how the enemy has came through the descendants of Ishmael to bring a counterfeit into the earth that is uh, Islam. And through Islam, there is a whole uh, counterfeit move trying to dislodge the covenant that God has made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Come on, church. And we are also now being rooted in Christ. Christ being the root of David are now all also sons of Abraham. Come on, do you understand that? 
So as sons of Abram, daughters as well, so by the way, but as, as a people coming from Abram, being God's new people in the earth, the church, God's same covenant, covenant of protection, covenant of love. Come on, covenant that is made with Abram, that same benefits are ours today. And the same war that is raging against covenant is raging against you and me. Can you understand that? Hallelujah. I'm teaching you strategies of how the enemy operates. So whatever you see in the physical, it's been violated in the spiritual. There's a spiritual reality for the sons and the daughters of God to see. You're asking me, why am I doing this teaching on this? It's because in this time that we're living in, I've got teenagers on all social media. Uh, we see an opposition, a different perspective, a non-biblical perspective on what's happening. And there's a rising anti-Zionist. Uh, what do you call that? Uh, uh, um, Anti-Semitism. Is that right? Yeah, that's rising again in the earth. And major uh, spiritual battles and things are at play. And if we don't teach our children good and well, they will not understand. As I said that Israel is there from the, the covenant that is with Abraham, the promise of the land. And we see over the ages how through biblical proof. Now, why is the people saying that that, that that is wrong? It's because they discount the biblical account. They don't say the Bible is the truth. They discount the biblical evidence. And then based only on modern evidence, they speak about the Palestinians, the Palestinian people, discarding the history that the Bible gives and even the evidence that is found in Jew... Jew no, what they, that they unearth archaeology. That's the right word. Even discounting that as not being truth today or true today. So somewhere somebody's going to say, hey, this is in the Bible. They've been the people of God way before the, it's, it was about two and a half thousand years after the promise that the Muslims and the Islam religion was only established. And for those two and a half years already, the, the Jewish people were living in the land. Come on, come on. That's just the truth. If you don't believe the Bible, that's not going to be your truth. But we know it's true because we have been heirs and we've been those who've been connected to that same promise today. And we have seen what God has done in the ages through this people. All right, so let's listen to Revelation 5 verse 5 to 6. I'm teaching it so that our children would know. I grew up like that. How many of you grew up in churches where pastors preached about these things? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Nowadays, pastors only preach and tell you you're going to be beautiful, you're going to be rich, you're going to have a new car. Hallelujah. Give your tithe. Give your tithe. I'm going to get you a new car. Come on. Huh? Trying to live that better life now religion. It's all, uh, uh, you know, this prosperity thing. Then one of the elders said to me, we just sang about the elders, ne? do not weep, see the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. That's a prophetic voice of a prophetic vision. Has already triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. And then I saw a lamb looking as if he had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, circled by the four living creatures and the elders. And the Lamb has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God uh, sent out into all the earth. So it's a vision of Jesus in the throne room. Vision, vision of Jesus. So the first thing they saw is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, the one that is triumphant. And then they saw the Lamb, the Lamb. Jesus came as a Lamb. He was crucified on the cross. He came as somebody that is meek and mild. They wanted him to come as a conquering hero the first time. Isn't that? But he came and totally did it the opposite way. Eh? He came and he was crucified, was born as a baby, ascended to heaven. If we look at the, the lamb. It is a, it's a creature that stick together. It's a communal creature. It's a social animal. 
Uh, it's a vulnerable, it brings comfort and safety. Uh, you know, we take our children to, to go and give milk to the lambs. We teach them when they go to sleep, count the lambs, you know, tell his car pieces, you can sleep so that you can only sleep rock. Uh, they eat grass, the animal that is not uh, going to be any threat to any other animals than humans. That's the sort of nature. And if that is the way that you are inclined to live and think and operate, you would only want to see those things about Jesus in the Bible. You would identify with his lamb-like nature. But do you understand that even though he was the lamb that was tender, that was loving, that we see that was an outcast, that suffered, that showed mercy to children, that showed mercy to, to women in need. Uh, we read about Jairus' daughter. We read about the Samaritan at the well. That's a wonderful piece of scripture, that one. He wept at Lazarus' death and his grave. We see this as Jesus hung on the cross, speaking tenderly to his mother Mary. He's a lamb, Jesus, the lamb. But I'm telling you, in his second coming... He is coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's a different coming. A lion is the king of the jungle. He eats whatever he wants to. Male lions protect their pack. And he will go to war against any other threat that come to that pack. Jesus as a lion is represented in scripture as the one that confronts the enemy when he was in the wilderness that laid his hand on demonically oppressed and cast out demons the one that made the whip and attacked the money chasers at the temple we saw that picture of jesus taking a stand against the worship of mammon of money so we see a different jesus in scripture than just the lamb nature of jesus so when Jesus returns the second time, he'll be the lion. The reason why he's not yet come as a lion is exactly because he's giving every sinner ample opportunity to make his choice here on earth. The Bible says there in Romans 2, verse 4 to 8, and I'm reading there. Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. The lamb nature is not there to lead you to a lukewarm life. It is not there so that you might just be able to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, and how you want to do it. The lamb nature of God right now is in this earth. So it says don't be presumptuous to think that God, Grace, mercy, tenderheartedness, kindness, what I just spoke about, the, the fact that you are validated by the king. Don't think that that gives you the idea that, that God is without judgment, that God is without fear, that you have to fear, that, that, that you think that God is just some of your buddy, your pal. Come on, church. The familiarity, it's a presumption based upon his kindness. He says, no, you've got to know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. But because of your heart and impatient heart, you are strong, st storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So God says, come on. Don't be presumptuous about this. My kindness is given so that you can repent. And you've got to know, you've got to know, you've got to know that when you do things with, which is presumptuous, with, which is uh, disregarding to the holiness of God, that is uh, familiarity before God, these things are storing up for yourselves wrath before God for the day of the Lord will come when He will come as the lion and the judge. Do you see that, guys? Where his judgments will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. We will stand as believers before God to be judged for what we've done with our lives after our salvation. 
So we will go to heaven be based on what Jesus did, but the rest of our lives will be judged before God. Are you storing up for yourself wrath in that moment? Or are you doing what they say here? Let's read on here. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. And then it says, to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, He will give eternal life. Amen? So come on, it, it does matter. It does matter how we, how we live, how we work, how we do our lives, what we do with what Jesus has given us after our salvation. So, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. How do I store up treasures in heaven? Through patience in well-doing, seeking for the glory and honor of Christ, seeking immortality. He says He'll give eternal life. Because the day is coming when God will judge the living and the dead. When the Son of Man's throne arrives on the earth, all will stand before that judgment seat. And we have a whole thing about that in our foundations course that we can go through again. Alright, so we understand that there will be a day that He'll come as a lion. That He'll come as a judge. And that's where we are now. So when the Bible was written in the beginning, the revelation of Christ on the earth was that of a lamb. Although there was a revelation of Him as a lion as well, but as we come closer to that day, we will meet Him as a conquering King. So some of us has to adjust our mindsets that when He comes, He will come with the roar of the cry of the lion of Judah. Come on. If you go to the book of Ezekiel, uh, chapter 39 and 38, 39, you will read about this war that is coming, this war that will end all wars. It's the same battle that is mentioned in Revelation 16, verse 16, that is said to be, I'm going to a city. Come on. These openings means Beulah land. Sweet Beulah. It's a beautiful song, man. Huh? There my home shall be eternal. Come on. Beulah land. Sweet Beulah land. Ach, praise the Yara. I'm going to be key. You let it good lear. You know, God said to me, teach the people again about heaven. Get them prepared for the glory. Get them in the presence. Come on, you've got to get comfortable with God in heaven, eh? Hallelujah. What did I say? We don't mean it. Three things. So He wants to get you out of the land. Now you think that is just by attacking your salvation, but there's theology in the earth today that says there's not going to be a heaven. Come on. Some of us has, to be, has got to be careful about this. It's the same attack. It's just another shade of the thing. It wants to get you out of the promise of the, the land, of the city. The city of the new Jerusalem. Eh? It's, it wants to destroy the lineage. It wants to destroy the whole history of Abram, Isaac. Jacob, come on church, Israel wants to get you to believe as a believer, those things don't matter anymore. Same spirit, we just call it renewing of renewal. Come on, stop that. See the strategy of the devil. Wants to destroy the lineage. We've got to know where we come from. Eh? Yes, there was a man by the name of Abram. He was from Ur in Chaldea. Eh? Is that right? He was a Babylonian citizen. He was a sinner like you and me. He was not yet a Jew. God saved that man, put his hand upon that man. He called that sinner out of that state that he was in, like he called you and me out of the state that we've been in. And he put purpose on his life and God used him. And from him the promise has come that we will be as unto the stars of the heavens, the sand on the sea. 
that is who we are. We are part of that. The fact that you serve Jesus is the fulfillment of that prophecy that came 3,000 years before Jesus came. That's got value, man. This thing has been coming long. <laughs> oh, boy. And the last one is want to change the biblical narrative. Wants to take the authority of the Word of God away. Now, Islam has done that. They've skewed it up. They say that the promise is not for Isaac, but it's for Ishmael. And they've got a whole faith that is a counterfeit faith to the, to the Jewish faith and also to the Christian faith. And that's why there's such a ruthless, violent spirit that is against the Jews and against the believers today. And, and see it for what it is. Your children live in a time where people say, come on, the biblical truth is no longer relevant. The Bible means nothing. We were in the car this morning. We had a conversation about somebody we, we know and, and how that these theologians teach that this is just stories. It's not history. This is not real. This is just, just the figment of somebody's imagination. Come on, church. We've got to be awake and be aware. The world judges the history of this world no longer than just 50 to 100 years. But you know that there's more. There's a greater history. There's, a great, there's evidence of the greatness of God throughout creation, not just over the last 50 years. Hallelujah. I don't base my faith as long as I'm old. I base my faith uh, as long as creation is existing. I add my faith with Abram. I add my faith with Isaac's faith. Come on. I add my faith with God's men and God's women in the Word of God. I am part of a great lineage. I believe the Word. The Word of God is the truth. Come on, church. And from the two and a half thousand or so prophecies, two thousand of them has already been fulfilled in the coming of Jesus the first time. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the other 500 is getting and being fulfilled as we live now, as Jesus is ready to come. And will be fulfilled in that coming of Christ in this day. This battle will continue until these nations physically will surround Israel and the spirit of violence will be stirred in these nations and it will overtake the nation of Israel. Just put that map on for me if you can. We read here in Ezekiel 38 and 39 of Choch uh, and Machoch. We read about something like um, Gomer. We read about uh, places that is called um, uh, uh, Libya, Ethiopia, Sudan, those areas. We read about them. All right. So the final battle, the battle of Armageddon, will be raged in a place called Armageddon in the West Bank area, close to Samaria, Judea. And we see these nations in biblical times, Russia, Machoch, we see uh, Gomer from the European nations coming in. You see there, I can't read there, so I've got to read here. So we read about the northern nations. Uh, uh, Persia, that is today Iran, playing a major role. Role That is the puppet master at the moment with all the jihad terrorist groups um, sending them out. People like Hezbollah and Hamas has been supported by them. The proxy wars being fighted uh, from them, we know about, I spoke about them. Then we read about Gomer. We read about the area named Togamara, which is Turkey. Uh, all of these are mus Muslim nations at the moment that is close to Israel. Um, Israel is right in the middle, the tiny nation. You can't even see it there on the map. That is how small it is based upon all the other nations that is around them. And in the south, we read about Libya, uh, and we read, you see the names that is used there, Kash, uh, Libya, and Put, that's the nations the Bible speak about where this attack would come from and would rage over Israel. We hear about places today like um, Yemen, where the Houthis are at, which is firing cruise missiles at Israel already. We're hearing about uh, 
American forces uh, bombing places in Syria, uh, bombing places in Iraq where they are attacking military bases, all around this nation of Israel. Now, why am I reading this to you? Because this is one of those 500 prophecies that we are yet to understand. But if we look at the geographical nature of it, we can see that something is cooking. That something is cooking. There's much more to this than just what I'm telling you right now. We have to find where we are settled or settling down as. At this moment, Russia with China and other BRICS nations, which we are part of, which forms 45% of the world population, is starting to talk about another world currency. They're trying to, to break the neck of the, the hold of the West uh, over the earth. And uh, the newest countries that has joined us, they're Muslim nations. There are nations like Saudi Arabia. Is that true? Come on, that's where we as a nation are positioning ourselves. And as wrath is turned, and as this violent spirit, the spirit of Hamas, go listen last week's sermon on the word Hamas and where it comes from, is turning up, turning up. Things are busy being, being organized like chess pieces on a chess board for the end to come. The last of the signs is the sign of a war that will end all wars. What am I saying? I'm saying we have to be awake to the fact that this might be it. What if it is? The Bible says we won't know. We won't know. But do you understand where we're at? Just looking at the signs around us. I think this sh should excite the church. Should propel the church. Should invigorate the church. It should get you excited to start to look beyond the small and the insignificant of the challenge of the day and start to see the big picture of what God is busy orchestrating in this world. You're asking, are we there yet? And I can say, not yet. Could be, but not yet. We'll see how this thing plays out. The Bible says that in the end... Israel will stand alone. How many of you are watching the news and seeing how this anti-Israel sentiment is rising all over? Hmm? It, the influence is so great that even America is now saying, trying to force them to at least do a three-day ceasefire. The pressure is on. The pressure is on for the fulfillment of prophecy to happen right in front of our very eyes. Why am I saying this, Carl? You know what? Because we really got a word for a prophet in this church that says he'll see the rapture. And so if I calculate his age and where I'm at right now, I need to preach about this, huh? And don't win thy prophecy. Hallelujah. Of I can frag lang leven, but we have to... <laughs> Uh, church, I hope that you understand my heart. The church of Jesus, the glorious bride of Christ, you are adorned with His glory and His presence. It is not the glory of God in this house because of who you are and because you are so special. It is because God is pouring out His presence and His glory. For it is for a time as this, for a people as now, He's preparing His bride. Ah, you see, the Spirit of the living God is out in your church. The power of God has been poured out over your community. And you think it's because you're awesome. And you think it's because you're a gifted preacher. Or you think it's because the anointing of God is upon you. I'm telling you, God is preparing you for the coming of Christ. God is getting His bride ready. God is pouring out all over the earth a revival power. A power of note, of presence, a glory that we've not seen. Worship like we've not seen in years. 
You know why? Because as he has gone to prepare a home for you, he's been busy preparing you for that home. <laughs> Hallelujah! Build the land, sweet build the land. All right, I'm not clear. I'm excited. I'm excited. You see, we war. We war in the spirit. We fight in the spirit. As long as the church of Jesus is in this earth, we can resist. We can set a standard. We can fight against the spirit of deception and the spirit of violence and anarchy. We can speak peace, be still. Come on. We, we can be the peacemakers. Come on, church. We can stand in the glory of God. Be the light of this world. Be the salt that fights the decay that the enemy wants to bring. It's time for the church to know. Come on, that's who you are. God has chosen you. God has put His hand upon you. It's not the time now to just sit back, do nothing, be lukewarm, be ineffective for Christ. I want a radical church. I want a church full of revolutionaries that will stand up and count, make it count so that there would be no soul left on the battlefield. Come on, church. That there will be no soul left untouched by the glory and the presence of God. We've got to get our state of readiness in order. Come on, church. The state of readiness in the church has to be uplifted. Hey, eh? Would you say with me, come on. Uh, yes, Lord, I am here. I'm ready. I, I want to be that light. I want to be that salt. I want to lift myself out of the temporal life, the mindsets of the temporal. Get my mind into the eternal. Start to think eternally. Come on, church. My joy is not based on what I have now, but I can see what I'm getting. Hallelujah. And he's gone to build me a mansion just over the hilltops. Come on, church. He's building me a mansion. He's preparing me for His glory. God's got His hand upon me for glory. God's got His hand upon you for glory. You will only be here for a moment and for a time. Your life, the Bible says, will be like the mist before the sun when the sun rises. Then it's there, then it's not. God is saying to you, He's called you for better things than these. Start to get your eternal perspective right. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right. Are your children ready? Have you done everything you can to get them into the glory? Have you done everything you can to teach them about God's ways? Are they filled with the Holy Spirit? Do they speak in tongues? Are they busy sleeping with the enemy? Hallelujah. I don't know. But are you ready? Did you get your children ready? Is your house ready? Come on, church. Here, Pastor, we're waiting for the university. And then we'll see what's going on there. I can't guarantee that your children would be the most successful human beings upon this earth. We can only do the best we can, then we have to release them. But one thing I can guarantee you, meneer mevro, we all will stand before a living God. And what you get into your kid concerning Christ is much more valuable than what you do for him, getting him to university, getting her to university, getting them through school. Come on. I want my kids with me in heaven. Huh? I want to dance with them on the streets of gold. Huh? We might be here for now, but don't forget where you're going. <laughs> we might be here for now, but don't forget where you're going. Your temporal life with temporal issues is not worth the worry if you see the eternal picture. <laughs> in this life there might be all sorts of trials and tests and tribulations testings of our faith but Jesus says take heed uh, be joyful rejoice always for I have overcome them all <laughs> my eyes is not fixed upon the temporal my hope is not fixed upon the temporal I'm not happy because I have a good job I'm not happy because I've got money in the bank I'm not, come on my joy is in my salvation 
when that final call sounds, my name is written in the book of life. Hallelujah. I will be going home. I will be seated with Christ in heavenly places then and now. For I know my name is written in the book of life. Come on. Do you see it? Can you see it? Can you rejoice with me? <laughs> this world is not my home. I'm just the passing through. <laughs> Woo! You lust ook niet blij, niet echt zo blij voor wat God is doing en wat He is about to release over your life. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1 to 4. That's where I'm closing today. Beautiful scripture, prophetic word. A day of the Lord is coming. <laughs> Jerusalem, when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your walls, I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. There will be a day, this is the physical one, the city will be captured, the houses ransacked, women will be raped, half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Verse 3 then the Lord will go out and fight against the nations. <laughs> Woo. You see, there'll be a day when there'll be a rider on a horse. <laughs> Hallelujah. When the angel armies will gather, will where the archangels will shout, the trumpet will sound, and my Lord will fight for us like never before. Come on, some of you don't believe this. Some of you think this is a fairy tale. The Bible says it. The Bible says it. The Lord will go out and He will fight against the nations, and He will fight on a day of battle. Verse 4, on that Day his feet will stand on the same mountain that he left on the day of ascension. He will put his foot down on that same mountain, the Mount of Olives, and he will say, Here I am, here I am. Come on, we cannot today neglect the truth of this prophecy and of the word of God for us. He will come to the east of Jerusalem. At the Mount of Olives, and it will be split into the Bible says, from the east to the west, from forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and the other half of the mountain moving south. Can you picture that? Can you picture that? When that day comes, we will come with Him on the clouds of glory. We will already be raptured away with Him. The wedding feast would already have been uh, happening. And we will come down with the King of glory. We will come with the angel armies. And we will be there that moment He sets His foot on the Mount of Olives. Then the Lord will go and He will fight. That is where history is going, church. That is where history is going. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess. Every president or minister. Every leader. I don't care if it is the leader of the United Nations of America. Every tongue, every knee, it'll confess, it'll bow before the King of Kings. When Jesus returns, the mountain will split and nations will be judged. You remember I spoke about nations that will be judged? South Africa will be judged in that day for where we put our alliances and allegiances. The Bible says the dead will rise, the war will end, the kingdom will come, his church will have full joy in Jesus Christ. When a demonic spirit of fear today is draining the church of hope and of joy and of courage, 
God's people are supposed to return back to scriptural prophetic word, find our joy, return our joy, return our hope, return our courage. Like Apostle Andre says, read the book. At the end, we win. <laughs> read the book. At the end, we win. I trust that God is stirring your joy for what is about to happen in this world. Let's stand. Some of you this morning, you are caught up in the temporal afflictions of the day. You're caught up with what has happened in your relationship with your children. What has happened maybe in your finances at work. You're treating God like an ATM, just wanting me to meet you at the point of your failure or at your need. My job this morning is to lift your eyes to the eternal. I've been trying my hardest, oh Jesus, to get them to see it. I might have failed, Lord, but please just have grace with us as humans. Let us see in the Spirit. Let us not judge things just based on what we read and what we hear and what we've convinced ourselves to be true. Let the Word speak. Let the prophetic speak. Let the prophetic speak. Open the eyes of our understanding this morning, O oh Lord, to see with Your perspective, Your eyes. I confess today, but this world is not my home. This world is not my home. I might be a citizen of South Africa, but this is not where my citizenship lies. It lies in a kingdom and in a city and in a promised land that is not made with human hands. While every eye is closed, nobody looking around, maybe you've backslidden in your life. You are in a state of backsliddenness. I don't know how to put it. You did serve the Lord. You did love the Lord. But you are in a place of rebellion and obstinance in your spirit. And you're listening to these things. You're saying that this is some nonsense. I, I'm not interested in this. Show me how I can live my life better. I'm speaking to you today. I'm bringing a word of rebuke to you. Don't let this be the last sermon you hear about heaven and hell. I'm calling you out of your state of lukewarmness and of a backslidden state. Jesus is calling. Jesus is calling. Young and old, everybody's eyes are closed. If God is speaking to you right now, even via the live stream, and you've messed up, and you're in a place where you are no longer where you need to be with God, come on, today is the day of reckoning for you and Jesus. Get your heart in line. Surrender your obstinance. Surrender your rebelliousness. Say, here I am, Jesus. It's just me. It's just me. Forgive me, Lord, for I have sinned against Thee. I have sinned against Your kingdom. Lord, forgive me. I'm so selfish. I'm so self-centered. Just repent there where you stand. Just open your heart to the Lord and say, Here I am, Jesus. Wash me with your word. Wash me with your word. Presence of God, just come and anoint and break the yoke in Jesus' name. The yoke of depression, the yoke of oppression, the yoke of failure, the yoke, Father, that is so heavy to bear. Just lift it in Jesus' name right now. Unburden, 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 O oh Lord, with your presence in this moment. I pray for the lukewarm heart to turn to Jesus, to say they're sorry, to commit to Jesus, to turn from their wicked ways, to turn to you, O Lord, to live a life fully alive for Jesus. In the name of God, I come and I ask Jesus, just do it now, do it now. There we are, just say, Lord, here I am, here I am.
lift up my eyes to where my help comes from. I lift up my eyes. I lift it out of the gutter, out of the negative, out of the depression, out of the circumstance. I lift it. I lift it. I lift my eyes and I see the fields are white unto harvest. Is there an interpretation of that tongue? Just quickly come and share it. I want every eye closed. I want you busy with the Lord. Everybody in this place. If you need to come to the front and just be with the Lord for a moment, just do that. Just be serious for a few more minutes. Just connect with God in your own way. Don't be quick to run now and just go. Just be sensitive to God. I want everyone in this place, young and old, Right now, if you need to come to the front, if you need to bow down before God, if you need to lay prostrate before the Lord, just do it now for the next few minutes. Everybody, just get busy with God. Just get busy with God there where you are. Kushan de Letere ba eshu kutonara ale shele ta ekhe enda da eshu
Bless you, church. Every eye, every eye, 